if you break down kind of the fundamental tenets of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, ultimately what we're advocating for is a tech agnostic policy approach. Don't discriminate against one technology or the other. Mm -hmm. Let the market decide essentially. Right. And again, if you and I, our kind of views or theses on Bitcoin are correct, that we think Bitcoin over time will win out against a lot of these other assets and that Bitcoin's unique properties make it uniquely situated to be something like a global reserve asset or be something like a protocol that we build payment layers on like Lightning mm -hmm. or any of these applications that you can claim for Bitcoin. We just want to make sure that if and when those things do come true, many of them are already happening in real time, that the U.S. is in a position to embrace that and benefit from it rather than pushing it away and some other country, you know, like yeah. China or Russia or any of these other countries, you know, could benefit benefit from it because Bitcoin's not going away. Right. We know that. Yeah. Our politicians don't really know that yet. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor, and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by N. Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C.com. Grant McCarty, welcome to the What Is Money Show. Thanks for having me. We're in uh, we're in Miami and we're, we've got AC. So yeah, yeah. Life's good. AC is pretty important in Miami. Um, very hot outside. We're sitting here on the eve of Bitcoin 2023. Um, thrilled you're able to make it down, have this conversation. Just by way of quick intro, you are the co-executive director at the Bitcoin Policy Institute. Um, what is that? What is the Bitcoin Policy Institute? I'm often finding myself on this show um, not in not much of a fan of politics or policy in the Bitcoin circles. Um, maybe you could tell me a little bit about why the Bitcoin Policy Institute exists and what you guys are doing. Sure. Uh, well, it's great because we agree on that first point. I'm not a huge fan of policy or politics mm -hmm. in the Bitcoin space either, uh, obviously, except for what we do and what a couple other organizations are doing. But yeah, uh, the Bitcoin Policy Institute, very simply, we're a think tank studying the future of money. We research Bitcoin and other open monetary networks. We've done stuff around central bank digital currencies. We've looked into you know stable coins. But at the end of the day, we are Bitcoiners who wanted to advocate for Bitcoin and we're looking for the most effective way to do that. And so we've brought together a cohort of 14 fellows, PhDs ranging from economics, environmental science, uh, and everything in between. And they're researching Bitcoin and national security, Bitcoin and its environmental impacts, uh, Bitcoin and its role in financial inclusion and human rights. And ultimately what we're doing is we are 
taking, you know, uh, legitimate academic research on Bitcoin and analysis, and we're packaging that in a way uh, that folks in Bitcoin can understand, or folks in DC can understand. Because mm-hmm. um, look, ever everybody gets in this technology in a different way. Mm-hmm. Everybody has to kind of have that message packaged in a different way. So we are one of many groups who packages Bitcoin arguments uh, for a specific audience. Interesting. Yeah, we one of the things we've hit on a lot uh, past two days, I've had Sailor and Lowry here, and both of those conversations flowed into the framing of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is such a weird, it's a strange thing because it's this radically new innovation, and it's as if we're trying to retrofit our old analogies onto it to describe it. You know, we, we say the internet of money, we say digital gold. Um, one of the, a unique framing they were putting on it was Bitcoin's like this global cybersecurity network. Um, so it is important that we frame it properly and it has to be proper to ultimately, I think the audience that you're speaking to. So speaking to politicians, policymakers, I'm sure requires a different framing than just money. Um, I think as you were saying offline, if you just frame it up as money, then that can spook some people (laughs) who who are very accustomed to the U S dollar kind of being the dominant monetary instrument. Um, so what what is BPI, what are their goals? Like it, you mentioned these credentialed experts who are bringing the DC to advocate for Bitcoin. Like what are, are their express goals for the Institute or are you guys just trying to kind of create this uh, a framing that's proper for Bitcoin at that level? Yeah, uh, we'll start there because that is kind of the high level goal is we're trying to push back against dominant narratives in mm. Washington. And the reality is most people who have heard about Bitcoin in the United States have heard about it in a negative framing, mm. right? They've heard about Bitcoin burning down the planet. They've heard about Bitcoin being used by cyber criminals and terrorists. And uh, they've heard of 18 year olds becoming millionaires uh, using Bitcoin or a lot of times Bitcoin is used as this catch all for crypto. Sure. So it's like they actually got uh, they became a millionaire from like Shiba Inu, yeah. but they just call it Bitcoin because right. if you don't know any better, everything in crypto is Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, more than anything, what we're trying to do is carve out Bitcoin specific conversations uh, in DC um, because right now a lot of the conversations are crypto conversations. They're Web3 conversations. And uh, I think the fact that you and I are talking to you right now is... Uh, <laughs> suggests that you and I view Bitcoin as different than all that stuff yeah, and requires its own unique uh, arguments. And we just want to make sure that when policymakers are making policy about digital assets, because at the end of the day, a lot of policy, it's not going to be Bitcoin policy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be Ethereum policy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be digital asset policy broadly. When they're making digital asset policy, Bitcoin needs to be top of mind. Mm -hmm. And the differences, the unique uh, benefits and drawbacks of Bitcoin, the unique properties that make Bitcoin Bitcoin, like proof of work, for example, Mm -hmm. that needs to be taken into account Mm -hmm. when we're discussing these technologies. And so BPI's broad goal, change the narrative in DC. Why are we trying to change the narrative? We don't want Bitcoin to be banned in the United States. Mm -hmm. We don't want proof of work to be banned. We don't want there to be an excise tax on energy Mm -hmm. for uh, proof of work mining. We don't want people to uh, be limited in their opportunity to self-custody. Right, So if you break down kind of the fundamental tenets of what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin, ultimately what we're advocating for is a tech agnostic policy approach. Don't discriminate against one technology or the other. Mm -hmm. Let the market decide essentially. And again, if you and I, our kind of views or theses on Bitcoin are correct, that we think Bitcoin over time will win out against a lot of these other assets and that Bitcoin's unique properties make it uniquely situated to be something like a global reserve asset or be something like a protocol that we build payment layers on like lightning Mm -hmm. or any of these applications that you can claim for bitcoin we just want to make sure that if and when those things do come true many of them are already happening in real time that the u.s is in a position to embrace that and benefit from it rather than pushing it away and some other country you know like china or russia or any of these other countries you know could benefit it benefit from it because bitcoin's not going away right we know that yeah our politicians don't really know that yet yeah the uh, preston push used an an analogy once that the genesis block was like the starting gun you know of a a sprint or something and so many countries just kind of sat on the finish or the starting line and haven't moved 
Um, and it seems like the United States maybe is falling behind, especially in the past three years, right? We're hearing these other countries are starting to mine it, starting to hold it. And in the U.S., we're still seeing this kind of democratic gridlock. Mm -hmm. What, you know, who regulates Bitcoin? What is it? Yeah. Um, and a lot of confusion surrounding Bitcoin and crypto, as you alluded to. How do you disentangle that one? Because I found that to be especially difficult. Even if you get people over the line on proof of work, right? Like all these other proof of stake and everything else is a farce. Yeah. People tend to say, well, why don't we just start our own proof of work coin, mm -hmm. you know, or this, what makes this proof of work coin better than, different than this one? How do you separate Bitcoin from shitcoin in the eyes of policymakers and politicians? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, one thing that I like, I'd like to start with is this concept that I've noticed in DC. Uh, and I think it's a very American concept as well. Uh, and human in many ways, like humans, we're inherently uh, hubristic in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. We think that we can control nature, right? We think, uh, oh, you know, it's hot out in Miami. So we created AC, mm -hmm. right? Uh, to make sure that we felt good all the time. Um, and you, you can find countless examples of that in human history. Uh, so we have this idea, like if we don't like something, we can control it. We can turn it off. We can change it. And one of the biggest hurdles that, you know, we've encountered talking to politicians is having to actually shift that framing around Bitcoin mm. and get them to realize that you can't just turn off Bitcoin, right? right. You, you, Bitcoin's not going to go away overnight just because some politician in the United States doesn't like it. Just because Brad Sherman says, you know, Bitcoin is bad. Right. That doesn't mean that you can just turn the off switch on Bitcoin and tomorrow, you know, there's no more Bitcoin. Mm. And so with that framing and uh, kind of starting with that, we get into uh, what sets Bitcoin apart. And it really starts with the fact that there is no CEO of Bitcoin. Mm. We don't even know who created Bitcoin. And that it is the most decentralized network, you know, that, that we know of yeah. um, on the planet. And so starting with that, it opens up definitely a Pandora's box, but it at least gets people thinking, hey, this is different than a social media company or a tech company. And I think one valuable framing that we've been able to latch onto is a lot of crypto and a lot of Web3. It's a founding team who created something and they're kind of stewarding that thing into existence. Mm -hmm. They are building use cases for that thing. They're, they're marketing that thing. It's... Silicon Valley with uh, you know a different skin mm -hmm. basically a lot of them are basically tech startups yeah. and Bitcoin is not a tech startup and so and there are all you know all sorts of reasons for that and the big one is uh, some folks in Bitcoin will use the term like the immaculate conception mm -hmm. right um, I try not to say that necessarily in like certain offices mm -hmm. But that idea is super valuable. And to your point of why don't we just create another proof of work you know, system, mm -hmm. a big idea here is that Bitcoin is Bitcoin because it was able to flourish kind of like in the shadows for a long time before governments started making policy around it, mm -hmm. before a lot of people really knew about it. And that's allowed it to be the most meritocratic system that we have today. And of all the cryptos that exist, the most uh, fairly distributed in terms of wealth distribution and a bunch of other distributions. So um, we take these things about Bitcoin, these properties that are foreign, that are really hard to wrap your mind around, mm -hmm. and we lean into those and we say, hey, that thing that, that scares you, that thing that concerns you about this technology, that thing that doesn't feel like anything that you've heard of before, that's because it isn't. Mm -hmm. And that's a good thing. And if we stop trying to fight against that, then ultimately we can figure out how to embrace this and make it good for all of us. But the more that we fight against it, uh, the harder it's going to be. Um, because to your point, we're seeing other folks start to embrace it and start yeah. to figure out how to yeah. kind of play nice with it now. You said hubristic nature again, right? That yeah. I guess politicians have become accustomed to thinking they actually do write the rules. Yeah. And in many cases, uh, makes sense, right? In many cases, and for a long time they have, but Bitcoin's something different. That you can't re rewrite the rules to Bitcoin, so you ultimately end up having to comply with the rules. Exactly. And so the, the regulators are becoming the regulated. Yep. It's a bitter pill to swallow, perhaps, but you know it's something. It's a regularity, 
like the rising and the setting of the sun at this point, right? Like TikTok next block, what yep. else are you going to do about it? Adapt or die sort of thing. Yep. And um, yeah, it sounds very brutal when I say it like that, but we need to get, I think that sense of urgency needs to be conveyed probably in a uh, more sugar-coated wrapper perhaps, but it, yeah. but it's real, right? Because again, that starting gun has sounded. Other countries are moving faster than us. The United States that has such a long tradition of being a, a Western liberal democracy, free market, strong property rights, all of these things that Bitcoin embodies. Um, it seems crazy to me that we haven't figured that out yet and are embracing Bitcoin as like one of the ultimate American technologies. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times Bitcoin gets compared to the early internet, mm -hmm. right? And we we use that analogy quite often as well because I think it is a valuable framing. A lot of the concerns over the early internet were very similar to the concerns over Bitcoin today. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the benefits are similar to the benefits that Bitcoin offers. I think one thing to uh, recognize with the early internet was um, even you know when the internet was uh, kind of TCP IP was created, you know, the, the protocol that everybody agreed upon, um, you know, in 1992, um, computers have been around for long before that. And the idea of an internet and an intranet had been around before that. And the people who were thinking about that were a lot of people in the government, right? It was a lot of people in uh, the CIA and the NSA and the FBI. And so the people who were some of the largest stakeholders of this technology, they'd had time to kind of take in some of the ramifications of right. this technology. And then they were also some of the early stewards of that technology and the ones who were kind of proliferating it and saying, you know, uh, ultimately, it, it's almost like it had their stamp of approval. And I think that that's my take on it is they had time to let this sink in. Bitcoin, as far as we know, uh, and there are some who will push back into this and say it was a group of NSA operatives who created Bitcoin, whatever it is. But as far as we know, um, the U.S. government didn't create Bitcoin and aren't the ones who stewarded it into its existence and its proliferation. So I look at this in a lot of ways as people are just playing catch up mm -hmm. and they're playing catch up with their mental models. And we're 14 years into this. And I think a lot of people can be very pessimistic on, uh, you know, the outlook of this technology in the sense of how our government, you know, government's going to look at it, regulators and politicians. Um, but I look at the Bitcoin community and I look at the tens of millions of people in the United States who own this technology, the hundreds of millions of people around the world who own and use this technology. And I think of the fact that in 14 years, it has gotten to that point, you know, it's outpacing the uh, internet and its mm -hmm. adoption 14 years into its existence. And I have to believe that uh, we're, we're playing a time game here yeah. and that over time people will start to understand uh, what makes this technology special. And they're going to come at that from a lot of different directions. Some people are going to come at it as we saw with many people during COVID and uh, the printing of trillions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, worth of U.S. dollars. And they're going to see it as a response to inflation. And that's going to be their rabbit hole to start thinking mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, name drop the yeah. <laughs> the podcast, what is money, yeah. right? I think a lot of people had that experience in 2020, 2021. Yeah. I think the crypto craze, love it or hate it, Web3, NFTs, all this stuff. Yeah. A lot of people have that phase and then they get into Bitcoin mm -hmm. and they realize, wait, this is different than a lot of the other stuff. And so people, some people are going to find it that way. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that people are going to stumble into Bitcoin and the fact that hundreds of millions of people have already done that and maybe hundreds of millions of people don't fully like get it mm -hmm. just yet. But the fact that hundreds of millions of people have already bought Bitcoin, to me, that's a great sign that what we need to do is just stop this thing from being essentially like shunned right. in the United States. And if we do that for long enough, then this thing reaches terminal velocity. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um... And the one, so one, I already asked the difference between Bitcoin and shitcoin. I find that to be a difficult question to answer succinctly because you get into all these, you know, proof of work, you have to talk about path dependence and network effects and first mover advantage and liquidity and chain security. There's all these sort of just abstract concepts I think it takes to understand why Bitcoin is fundamentally different than everything else. So that's one that's hard to answer. The other one, the other piece of FUD that's very difficult is Bitcoin's energy usage. Yep. And I don't know if this was on purpose or what, but the mainstream media has done a phenomenal job of equating the usage of energy 
equals environmental pollution, degradation, destruction. Like they are the same thing. If something uses a lot of energy, it just destroys the environment. Obviously that's not the same thing, right? The more energy we use, the more prosperous we are, the more civilized we are. We want as an economy to use more energy. That's how we increase our standard of living. What we don't want to do is pollute. We don't want to dump garbage in the oceans and things like that. So they're fundamentally not the same thing. Yet that is one of the primary, let's say, descriptor attack vectors on Bitcoin. It uses too much energy, therefore it's bad for the environment. How do you guys address that? How do you dismantle that argument and uh, disentangle energy usage from environmental pollution? It's a great question. And as you'd imagine, it's super complex, but a big part of what we do is take these complex ideas and how do you distill it into a 30 second talking point? And so I think number one is you, you hit on it that energy usage and carbon emissions are not the same thing right. and they're not one to one and that you could be using a lot of energy, but if that energy is coming from wind or coming from solar, that ultimately that's going to be a lot better for the environment mm -hmm. than uh, let's say like fracking and using uh, natural gas or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so one, like you said, disentangling energy usage from carbon emissions and energy usage from environmental impact that is key uh, because unfortunately, very few people actually seem to get that distinction. Um, two, I think once you've done that, you're able to point to uh, the energy stack of Bitcoin mining in the US, for example. And there is a little bit of data out there. Uh, it's not always, some of it, is, a lot of it is like industry reported data. A lot of them are like best estimates. Um, but even the most conservative estimates of Bitcoin's sustainable energy stack and renewable energy stack is it's about double the uh, percentage that the average American household uses of uh, renewable or sustainable energy. Mm -hmm. So what you're actually able to say is, hey, this industry, yes, it uses a lot of energy, but a lot of that energy is uh, renewable or sustainable. And we have these trends that shows that, you know, that percentage is, is growing greater over time. But I do think you, you've touched on um, you, you reach these uh, these tree branch moments or these forks in the road where you realize that some things are just about a matter of principle. Mm -hmm. And the matter of principle we're getting at is this principle of a degrowth mindset versus an abundance mindset. And a lot of folks will characterize it in some ways as like a left versus right thing in the United States, like Democrats versus Republicans, like Democrats want to stop people from using energy and Republicans want you know, everybody to use as much energy as they want and they don't care what it's going to do to the environment. I think both of those are gross mischaracterizations. There are a lot of uh, Republicans in the United States who think that we should have an abundant use of energy, but they don't necessarily think that we should be destroying our environment uh, sure. in the process. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of Democrats who also have that same idea. There are also a lot of Democrats who have a degrowth mindset who are looking at some of the data out there around um, man-made climate change or man-made global warming and they're freaked out and they're looking at this and they're going we're not doing a good enough job of building out renewable sustainable energy we're not going to reach these goals that we need and our planet's going to burn up in 100 years and so we just need to stop using energy altogether or we need to slow down our energy usage mm -hmm. and i think that's a really harmful you know uh framing and and so what we try to do is come at it from the the principled perspective of well, what are you really getting at there you're starting to um create an arbitrary system where we now decide what energy is socially acceptable and what energy is not socially acceptable. Once you start talking about degrowth of energy, we now have to have an arbiter of what energy is valid and useful and what energy is not valid and useful. What's a better outcome? A better outcome that even you know folks on the left who really are, uh, again, worried about the environment, who want more renewable, sustainable energy, what do they want? They want our energy to be more green. And so what are we really trying to do? We want to create more solar plants uh, around the country. We want to create more nuclear. We want to create more wind farms. We want to do all these things. And so what we try to do is loop Bitcoin into that argument and say, hey, Bitcoin is not this thing that's going to burn down the planet. Um, and here are these facts and reasons why. But on top of that, here's how Bitcoin can actually lead to energy abundance in the United States mm. and sustainable energy abundance. And then you get into these ideas of co-locating uh, Bitcoin miners with uh, a nuclear energy facility right. or uh, with a solar energy facility. Um, the idea that Bitcoin mining 
uh, can actually be used to incentivize the building out of renewable projects. And the final piece that I want to hit on here that I uh, I think is very important, and I've realized that even the folks in D.C. who work on energy environmental issues, a lot of them don't actually understand how our energy grids work. And so even if you are an environmentalist, it doesn't mean that you actually understand how an energy producer produces energy and gets it from point A to point B to point C to point D. Mm. And I've realized that like energy and the environment and those two topics, even though they should be inextricably linked, you could be an environmentalist mm -hmm. and be advocating for renewable energy and not know a damn thing about how our energy grids work. And so I've realized that there is this uh, idealistic view of what we need to do as a country in terms of uh, energy usage and environmental impact of that energy usage. And then there's a disconnect with the actual pragmatism of how we get to that point. Mm. And so one of the things that we're able to do is say, hey, look, you and I, we're, we're on the same side. You want more sustainable energy in the United States. That's good for everybody in the United States. We have more sustainable energy production. It means we don't have to rely on other countries. It means mm. it's cheaper. It's better. All these things. So how do we get there? Well, all right, you want, uh, you want a lot of solar. You want a lot of wind. You want a lot of nuclear. Okay. What are the best projections right now? The best projections are in order to kind of reach our uh, um, environmental goals, we need to like 10x the amount of solar, of wind, of renewable and sustainable mm -hmm. energy uh, production in the United States. So that's what we need to get to. Mm -hmm. And the best projections, even the most optimistic projections, we're like not even close. We're, we're like we're not even close on our current trajectory to doing that. So the question is, how do we fill that gap? from where the projections say we're going to be in terms of building out renewable and sustainable and where we all want to be. And then this is where the common ground is. And that's where Bitcoin mining fits. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector, and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is a Bitcoin-enabled alternative to legacy health insurance. Now let's face it, legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. This is insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. There's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> And I give a company some money in case shit happen. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> so with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. 
you guys are a think tank basically right what yeah. um let's talk about that like what we hear a lot about think tanks i I think i typically hear about them in more of a negative light let's say it tends to be someone funding uh, a group of researchers to try and influence policy in a certain way um what what is what why are think tanks important in the, in the current political paradigm it's a great question i think it's important to think about the overall political landscape and the different groups and different uh incentives that you know politicians will have that regulators will have but also the different types of advocacy that you can have so uh let's just think about the average politician for example uh the average politician is going to have um you know, a staff, and let's say it's a dozen people, they've got a legislative director and they've got legislative assistants. And each of those legislative assistants is focused on a couple of different issue areas. So let's say one is focused on the energy and the environment, and another is focused on financial services and uh, economic policy, and another is focused on healthcare. And you kind of go down the line, and each of them has a bucket of the information that they need to care about. I mean, we've gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole for what, years? And we're still, I don't know, tip of the iceberg. Maybe you're further along down that iceberg than me, but like- We don't know where the bottom is, so nobody knows how far along we are. (laughs) Exactly. So, and this is what we do full time, right? We're reading about this stuff. We're talking about this stuff. Um, So that's where you and I are at. We recognize that. Um, And I don't mean to speak for you. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's correct. Yeah. Now think about the staffer who's read a couple headlines about right. Bitcoin right. and has heard about crypto and crypto punks and uh, um, you know whatever other NFT yeah. you know thing that that's been going on and and they they are getting uh, lobbied by Ripple and Stellar mm. and um, Avalanche and uh, Ave and you go down the line right like yeah. these are the people that they're hearing from. And you think about how much attention that is actually being given to a specific issue um, in their bucket, it, they're already, they have fractionalized attention. Yeah. Um, they have fractionalized attention on cryptocurrency broadly. Now they have even further fractionalized attention on something like Bitcoin. And so you've got uh, industry companies. So you've got, let's say, a company like Riot Platforms, mm-hmm. for example. They've got, you know, had a policy. And that head of policy is going to be going and talking to that staffer and talking about, hey, here's a little bit of info about Bitcoin mining and here's info about Riot platforms and here's what we think about your policy. So that's like the company, the industry side. And then you've got, uh, let's say, environmental organizations who are talking to that staffer and saying, hey, Bitcoin's bad. It's destroying the planet. And then you've got uh, the crypto lobbying arms in D.C. who are saying, hey, Web3 is good and proof of work Proof of stake's way better, right? Mm -hmm. So the staffer's hearing from that person. And then the staffer is hearing from, uh, you know, other staffers that they're talking to. They're hearing from other think tanks focused on other issues. Um, They're hearing from all these different groups. And basically a think tank is one of many types of advocacy organizations that can disseminate information to that staffer and Mm -hmm. to the politicians above them. Mm -hmm. And so I think think tank is valuable to look at in that broader view of how does policy work in the United States. And it's really a group of 20 somethings who are staffing for these politicians who need to take in a ton of information and they need trusted sources Mm. who can tell them, hey, I know you don't have the thousand hours to go down the rabbit hole. Mm. I've done that for you. Here's a one pager with some of the most important information. Or here's a white paper about central bank digital currencies that one of our PhDs wrote. And you should read that. And basically, to go back to your original question, what good is a think tank or what does a think tank do? Even why does BPI exist? People in DC are looking for information mm-hmm. and they're looking for information from trusted sources. Mm-hmm. And the, the highest value thing you can do for someone in DC is be someone who they trust, be someone who shows up continually and be the curator of information mm-hmm. rather than just letting them go off on their own. Yeah. So a think tank creates new and original research and analysis. And then what I do is I take that research and analysis and I put it in a one pager and I get my talking points. And when you're talking to these staffers in these offices, you've got 30 minutes, you got 60 minutes. Mm-hmm. So I can't explain the whole global monetary system in, in 30 or 60 minutes to them. But what we can do is say, hey, here's what your office cares about. Here's what your boss cares about. Here are the policy issues that you're currently focusing on. 
and here's how Bitcoin fits into those policy issues. And here are three or four people with expert credentials who say this thing. Mm. And that is like worth its weight in gold in DC. Info is worth its weight in gold if it's coming from the right person. Got it. Must be difficult though, right? Going toe to toe with these, I guess, crypto and other funded think tanks that are using a lot of proceeds from these scammy rug pulls and then pumping it back into Washington to try and, I imagine, steer policy away from Bitcoin and make it more favorable for shit coins. Yeah. Um, how do you guys stand out? Because I'm sure, you know, I'm sure they're more well funded. I would imagine. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> they are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like they are. And and one of the reasons why is any of these crypto organizations, um, like Stellar, for example, not to fully call Stellar out, mm -hmm. but just like Stellar is this Web3 project and they have a coin and they also have the Stellar Foundation. Mm -hmm. And the Stellar Foundation has lobbyists and has policy people that they can fund using their profits from the yeah. Stellar Protocol yeah. um, to go talk to all the offices in, in DC. So yeah, you're up against every single big crypto project has one of those. Yeah. And then you add on the FTXs of the world and uh, the Web3 exchanges and the OpenSea and all these things and whoever has their own policy team. And so, yeah, uh, we are fighting an uphill battle. I think a couple things help us stand out. Um, one of the big ones is post FTX. I think there was actually a lot of uh, caution around who people in DC are going to interact with when it comes to crypto issues. Mm -hmm. And they're not just gonna take every meeting from some big crypto company because their CEO is a millionaire or billionaire. Right. Uh, they're not gonna do that anymore because they did that once and mm -hmm. they all got really embarrassed. Right. So what they're really looking for now is who can I trust? And look, everybody's got their their own game. I get it. But at the end of the day, we're, we're a 501c3 organization, which means that uh, we're a nonprofit and we're like our nonprofit mission is education. We're not formally lobbyists. We do a lot of things that lobbyists might do. We do lawmaker education. A lot of our uh, talking points will be similar to what a lobbyist would say, but we're not going in saying, you need to vote on this piece of legislation, otherwise X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. We're saying, hey, here's what this legislation would do. Here's what our experts have to say about this legislation. And what this has allowed us to do is maintain an air of credibility that a lot of other organizations don't really have. And one of the reasons for that is because when you look at the other crypto organizations that are out there, a lot of them are like industry associations, mm -hmm. which means that they're funded by a hundred crypto companies mm -hmm. and those companies pay money every month. And then that organization advocates on behalf of all those crypto companies. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a politician and somebody's saying, hey, crypto is good, and the person who's saying crypto is good is getting their paycheck written by a company who works in crypto, there's this clearer like vested interest in why that person might think crypto is good. Mm -hmm. um, now look, obviously people in our organization think Bitcoin is good. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us own Bitcoin. So you can't fully get away from the vested interest piece. But what we can say is, hey, I'm not an industry shill. You think uh, crypto is full of scammers and liars and cheats? Me too. Mm -hmm. And what we're able to do is actually like a lot of the hate around crypto comes from predatory marketing. Mm -hmm. It comes from the scamminess, the uh, speculation of it all. Mm -hmm. And what we're actually able to do is say, hey, we agree with you mm -hmm. on like all of that stuff. Right. Now here's why Bitcoin is different. Mm -hmm. And because we're not an industry association, because we're an independent nonpartisan organization, um, we're able to get meetings with certain offices that you might not actually expect we would get meetings with. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to talk to people about Bitcoin in a way that you might not be able to talk to uh, um, in another situation. So a lot of it comes down to the way we structure our organization, the commitment to nonpartisanship and the commitment to like being data driven mm -hmm. at every possible moment and not compromising on the data and not compromising on the principles. Even if some folks would say, uh, hey, misinformation is being used against us. So we need to play their game. Mm -hmm. I think as soon as you stoop to that level, mm -hmm. you're just so far gone. Yeah, what do they say? What's that old saying? You should never wrestle with a pig because the pig likes it and you get dirty, something like that. Exactly. Um, okay, so what what are people in D.C. saying about Bitcoin versus crypto? I mean, 
again, difficult to disentangle. I'm wondering if there are distinct opinions developing in DC about the way Bitcoin is looked at versus the way crypto is looked at. Um, what What is the, the, the general view on those two things? Yeah, I would say the general view is still very much using the term crypto broadly and not fully understanding the distinctions. They're like a catch-all for either one, yeah. right? Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's not getting better. Yeah. And don't take that from me. Uh, we actually hosted the Bitcoin Policy Summit a few weeks ago in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. And one of the speakers that we had there was Senator Lummis, and she's speaking to an audience of a couple hundred people. And we actually, we live streamed this as well. So mm -hmm. if you want to check out, you know, shout out to Swan, you know, our live stream partners. I'm sorry if- uh, It's all good. Yeah, uh, <laughs> free sponsorship. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's it's online. You can check this out and you can listen to Senator Lummis' fireside. And she's talking to me and I ask her, hey, post FTX, a lot of your colleagues who were seemingly pro-innovation, pro-crypto, and we're talking about that a year ago about all the promise in this industry like they're a wall they're nowhere to be found now <laughs> right where where did they go Air market blues <laughs> <laughs> exactly and and how are you able to sit up here at a bitcoin policy summit six months removed from the ftx 32 billion dollar implosion and how are you able to sit up here and say bitcoin is good and actually be advocating for a policy that is like supportive of this industry and you can hear her response but she starts out and says, well, it's in no small part to people like you all who have maintained that this technology is interesting and maintained that this technology is fundamentally different than the other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. And so that was one, it felt really good, you know, just like personally to be told, hey, the Bitcoin Policy Institute carving out Bitcoin specific conversations, mm -hmm. it's actually having an impact. Um, but two, it was a really encouraging sign to hear that from a sitting senator saying that from the beginning of her time in office to now, she's actually seen a distinct change in the way that people talk about crypto um, to the way that they talk about you know crypto then to the way that they talk about crypto now. And she used the analogy, she says, when she first got into office, I believe it was 2017, uh, she said, Bitcoin was the Kleenex of crypto. Mm -hmm. And you know we, we say all of tissue paper, we're just like, that's a Kleenex, yeah. right? I'm yeah. just, and Q-tip is the same yeah. way, right? Yeah. Um, instead of cotton swap. In the South, it's Coca-Cola. Like, send me a Coke. <laughs> send me a Coke. Or video games, just all be Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So Bitcoin was that to crypto. Everything was a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And now, 2023, we're actually having legitimate, serious policy-oriented conversations in D.C. about things like stable coins. Mm -hmm. Lummis and Gillibrand's bill specifically mentions Bitcoin right mm -hmm. in that legislation. Um, we're talking about things like DeFi protocols. And so the most important thing is not that all of those are on uh, this like, well, actually the most important thing is that all those are on an equal playing field. And in order for that to happen, they need to have distinct segregated discussions. Mm -hmm. You can't just lump them all together. Right. Um, and that comes back to one of the core BPI theses, which is crypto is not a monolith. Yeah. And when you start talking about it like that, you're going to end up with bad policy. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's just not, it's not looking at a, at a high enough resolution, right? You're just lumping everything together and you can't make sense of it. Exactly. Um, you know, I don't know if this is useful or not, but it's just a framing that I've, in terms of trying to simplify why Bitcoin, not shitcoin, if people are old enough to remember the emergence of the internet, there was a time when specifically like fortune 1000 companies thought they did not need to use the internet right they're like oh no we're going to use our own private corporate intranet yep. and that will give us all of the features that we need it's kind of like the blockchain not bitcoin argument like it just doesn't you you give up all the advantages of bitcoin when you try to pull out the blockchain and use that as a separate thing like it, it doesn't make sense um maybe if there's people that are old enough to remember that you could draw an analogy there, right? It's like what intranet is to internet, shitcoin is to Bitcoin. Definitely. That is, it's the openness of the network that really gives it all of the advantages and makes it fundamentally different than everything else. Exactly. And yeah, that that is the beautiful thing about the internet is that we kind of all collectively decided, hey, this protocol, TCP IP, right. we're going to use that. And the shared benefits of agreeing to use this thing are going to outweigh whatever individual benefits a, a one-off intranet could right. you know, give to one individual group or person or entity. And Bitcoin is the same thing. 
and uh, I'll tease this because I want to put a little bit of uh, of pressure on him. But I have a buddy who uh, was a dev at Ripple, and I uh, was a dev at Ripple for a while, and he's since left the company very recently. And he has come full circle, like a lot of uh, people who get into Web3 and crypto, where he's a software guy. He's really interested in the technical challenges that Web3 presents. Mm -hmm. And so something like Ripple, which is a really a perfect parallel to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. It's this it's this private system that the Ripple Source. Foundation uses. Yeah. yeah. And and they work with, you know, specifically with banks and on ramps and off ramps. Um, this guy has come full circle and realized that Ripple made sense when it was created because Bitcoin didn't have the capacity to do what Ripple was doing and you needed these kind of off-ramps and off-ramps. But if you want a truly globalized system like this and the most efficient system, it needs to be free and open source. Uh -huh. And he's come full circle and now this guy is like so orange-pilled and wants to dedicate his career to lightning. That's good. And I'm like trying to pressure him to talk about this stuff publicly because he knows a lot of you know private stuff about yeah. Ripple and about why an intranet won't work an internet type protocol won't work from a technical perspective in the way that something free and open source yeah. will yeah no it's it's great and uh still a, a little bit difficult of an argument because you're talking about like the open nature of a network and the economic advantages that has versus a closed source network but as an analogy right to what we saw what yeah. we saw intranets go away and the internet become what it is today might be useful for for decomposing those two things. Um, you mentioned the Bitcoin Policy Summit event in DC. Yep. Uh, so what was that? What are, are you guys doing more of those events? Is that part and parcel to, to what you're doing at BPI? Yeah, so that was a uh, first inaugural event, you know, hosted by the Bitcoin Policy Institute. And this event was all about, again, carving out Bitcoin specific conversations in DC, getting policymakers in the room with folks in the Bitcoin industry, and then a lot of folks from uh, the Bitcoin Policy Institute side and putting them all together to talk about Bitcoin. And there are a couple big reasons we did this. One is there's this like social signaling effect that a lot of people in DC that we've had private conversations with have told us, hey, we're interested in Bitcoin, we're open to it, but they don't really know where to go from there. And they don't have like friends that are into this stuff. They don't have colleagues that are into this stuff. So they don't really have the jumping off point to actually talk about this stuff publicly and to actually work on this stuff publicly. So more than anything, one of the big things that we wanted to do at the Bitcoin Policy Summit was get a bunch of these serious policy people in the room together so that they could all kind of point across the room and go, wait, I know that guy. And he works at a $30 million a year think tank. And he's here talking about Bitcoin. And I work at one of the biggest super PACs in the country. And I'm interested in Bitcoin. And that person works at a, a lobbying arm that I'm familiar with. And what that does is it makes people like, they just feel like they're not alone now. Mm. They feel like they're, if they go out publicly and talk about this thing, they're not going to get made fun of. They're not going to be right. the only one, right? Um, it's like if you were in, in class in elementary school and your teacher's like any volunteers, mm -hmm. you never want to be the only kid right, 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 <laughs> that, right, that's right. volunteering for sure, for, you know, to go up in front of the class. It's embarrassing yeah. um, for some people. And uh, so what we want to do is create a space where people could go in and get some of that social signal and then have some off the record conversations, right? Yeah. So we had the panels and the panels lay the framework for orange pilling people who aren't quite there yet. But then we also created this environment where if you heard from, uh, for example, we had a, a panel with Alex Gladstein, uh, Fadi El Salamin, Roya Maboub, and Marona Stefanos talking about Bitcoin and its human rights potential. And if you hear that panel and hear about the real life use cases of Bitcoin from people, you know, people call them real life superheroes. Mm -hmm. Seriously, mm -hmm. people who are who are uh, fighting for some of the most fundamental human rights um, on a day to day basis and you hear it from them. And then you're able to actually go speak to that person and talk to them for 30 minutes about uh, how Bitcoin plays a role in their life. And then you're able to say, hey, can I and this happen? We have uh, folks from U.S. Uh, agencies who are now asking uh, people from that panel to deliver presentations to their whole department. Wow, um, that's great. So that was the point, right? We wanted to uh, orange pill in a way that people in DC are comfortable being orange pilled. Mm -hmm. And it's come to a conference, dress up, be around a bunch of serious people who have a tie on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can roll your eyes at it, but like 
there's a game in DC. And so we're bringing Bitcoin arguments to the DC game. Hmm. Wow, that's great. That definitely sounds like a valiant mission. Um, what? Okay, we talked about earlier, like the framing of Bitcoin and how it really does seem very important because different people are going to approach Bitcoin from different intellectual avenues. So if you are a money nerd, you might understand the money aspect, but if you're a cybersecurity nerd, maybe you understand that aspect better than money. And there's a lot of different vectors to come at it. Um, what do you think the, I guess, first of all, how does BPI, like how might BPI talk about Bitcoin as an organization versus how Bitcoiners might talk about it? I imagine it's a lot less of the libertarian philosophy and anti-state stuff, I would imagine. Uh, and what do you think the proper framing for Bitcoin is when addressing politicians or policymakers? Yeah, you just can't go into a congressional office and say <laughs> Bitcoin's taking over the U.S. dollar. Yeah. Like, you, you just can't. And there might be a few politicians who agree with you, but they're not going to say that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think the most helpful way of thinking about how BPI approaches our framing is to start with the basics that can be applied to anyone. And what we do is for any time we're making an argument, we look at who is our end audience Mm -hmm. and what are their incentives. And in DC, those incentives are fundamentally different than the incentives of a company, for example, like uh, like MicroStrategy. MicroStrategy just had MicroStrategy World Mm -hmm. and they had this whole day on you know, Bitcoin and Lightning for corporations. Mm -hmm. Now, Bitcoin's benefits and Lightning's benefits for corporations are going to be different than a politician's, you know, views on on Bitcoin and and Lightning's benefits. So what are we doing? We're working backward from their incentives. A politician, if you're in the House of Representatives, you're working on a two-year time frame. You are constantly campaigning. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, as much as Bitcoiners, you know, might not like it, you're not going to win most campaigns saying that like the U.S. is losing global dominance and that you know, uh, the U.S. dollar is is going to lose its pegs, the global reserve asset, and that we need to look for something else. You can believe that privately. A politician is not going to, you know, put their entire career on the line for that argument mm-hmm. yet, right? right? So what do we need to do? We need to get people to be interested in Bitcoin, to believe that Bitcoin is good, but we maybe can't go as far down the rabbit hole as some folks might like. Mm-hmm. And so one, it's the incentives of thinking, hey, these politicians are working on two or six year time frames if they're in the Senate mm-hmm. and they're trying to get reelected. They're trying to get votes, money, mm-hmm. and they're trying not to get embarrassed by their colleagues. Mm-hmm. Right. So those are their base incentives. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use, all of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin, and for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code breedlove and then we look at what do we actually need for bitcoin to thrive in the united states and we don't need pro bitcoin policy necessarily we don't need like a tax incentive for companies to use bitcoin like that's not that that's a big reason why we're not really lobbying in many ways because we don't actually have like um 
a bill in a lot of cases that were like, that would be amazing for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the beauties of Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is best when it's left alone. Mm -hmm. And that if our ideas of what Bitcoin is and can be are true, then letting that play out over time is the best thing that we can do. So what is our ultimate goal at BPI? We don't need everybody to love Bitcoin. We need people not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. We need it not to be banned in the United States. So we take, as I mentioned earlier, just we get to the easiest possible point that we can to get somebody to think that Bitcoin is good. And so that framing in many ways is going to be Bitcoin as humanitarian technology, Bitcoin as uh, a hedge against inflation. Um, you know, that, that digital gold idea is valuable for some people. Um, each politician is going to be different because each politician has different talking points and different things that are unique to their platform. Um, and then the final thing to the broad framing, though, and I think this is getting at your question, is this concept of Bitcoin as a public utility. Mm -hmm. And I think this is really valuable because a lot of people ask us uh, in meetings when we say, hey, you uh, look at the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network is built on top of Bitcoin. It's layer two, yada, yada, yada. And they'll say, wait, I thought Bitcoin was digital gold. I thought it was a, an asset that you could park your money in and it, you know, it would build value over time. And one thing that we have had to learn not to fight against is that Bitcoin is many things. Right. And For Bitcoin sure. isn't just one thing. Yeah. And if you try to pigeonhole it, you end up losing out on all the other amazing things that come from, you know, uh, being outside of that one specific That's right. thing that you're talking about. Yeah. And so talking about Bitcoin in this broader sense is Bitcoin as a public utility. Bitcoin is a protocol that you can build on. Bitcoin, the lowercase b, the monetary asset being one piece of the Bitcoin puzzle, but then the Lightning Network being another piece of the Bitcoin mm -hmm. puzzle. And moving on from that, uh, moving forward with that framing, we found that to be especially valuable because now all of a sudden you are thinking about Bitcoin as analogous to the internet in some ways, but you're also thinking about it as something fundamentally different than most, you know, any other technology that we've seen before. And so I know that was a really sprawling way of answering your question, mm -hmm. but uh, to summarize it, the framing is different for every single person. Yeah, and a lot of times you got thirty or sixty minutes, so you're not able to go down the, all the rabbit holes. Yeah, you just need to get them to get them to the point where they're realizing, hey, Bitcoin is good, and uh, it's the final thing that I can add to that is, what do politicians care about? Money, votes. How do you get people to vote for you? I don't know, talk about how many jobs you created, mm. you know, how many jobs you brought to your state, that kind of thing. So what are politicians really looking for? What's the type of thing that BPI can offer them? We're trying to offer them data around, um, you know, Bitcoin's job creation, mm. or if they're concerned about the environmental piece, we can offer them data around there. Mm. You're really just answering pain points. And so uh, if you work in marketing, you realize that that's it's the exact same thing, yeah. right? You're responding to pain points. Mm. And it's kind of funny because the more I've, delved into this, the more I've realized policy work is just, it's marketing. Yeah. You're putting the right message in front of the right person at the right time. Right. To try and get laws passed that are favorable to what you're supporting ultimately. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. That's the, the product you're trying to get somebody to buy. Right. But the difference between your think tank and other think tanks is you're actually selling Bitcoin as an idea, even though it doesn't directly benefits you obviously if you hold bitcoin you indirectly benefit yeah but compare that to stellar or ripple right they're just actually shilling their own yeah. shit coin yeah so it's like a, a principled think tank basically pretty much yeah. and one of the coolest things I, i'd encourage you you know check out the fellows that we've got on our website one of the best things about the team that we've assembled is each of them have their own independent careers and credentials that they came into bitcoin with mm. So some of these professors are some of the most well-respected, you know, professors, uh, economists in the country, for example. Um, I'll shout out one of them for uh, just because Dr. William Luther. He's been cited literally thousands of times, his research on inflation, on mm -hmm. U.S. economy, thousands and thousands of citations. I think he ranks in like the top 5% of U.S. economists in terms of citations. So this guy had a whole career before Bitcoin. And now he's coming into these meetings and writing and saying, I believe Bitcoin is good for X, Y, Z reasons. Mm -hmm. And you're not just looking at him as some tech bro who, again, is shilling their coin. 
you're saying this is a respected person who had a whole career yeah and he's potentially putting his career and reputation on the line by talking about this mm -hmm. thing that a lot of people think is a scam i there's something there yeah. i should take that seriously and i should take his words seriously yeah and so as much as people don't like to hear it you know some people get hung up on um the idea that we have PhDs writing our stuff and that we have a pretty high bar to publication for BPI. And a lot of people will ask, well, why do you need a PhD to do this stuff? Mm. And you don't. If you can if you can write peer reviewed, you know, a level academic literature mm. without a PhD, more power to you, you know, send that over to BPI. Like we'd love yeah. to publish that. Um, but there is something to be said for the credential game yeah. and the fact that in the fiat world we live in and, and in DC, especially DC, oh my God, don't even get me started about reputations in DC mm -hmm. and egos in DC and the things that people are looking for. People want to hear about what college you went to and they're, they're judging you based on that. Uh, they want to hear about what fortune 500 company that you were an executive at. Right. right. And so what we do is we bring, people who have who check those boxes for people in dc to say all right you pass you pass this checkpoint right now i will listen to what you have to say right yeah it makes so much sense and I, it really is a battle of ideas right that's the whole point here is we're trying to smash these ideas together and see which one is the best and i think um sun Tzu said like terrain is the first consideration of any conflict and I, the thing Bitcoin really has going for it. It obviously doesn't have these shitcoin rug pulls to fund think tanks in DC on its behalf, but it does have this technical, historical, and ethical high ground, right? It's like to advocate for Bitcoin, you're not, again, you're indirectly advocating in your own interest because Bitcoin, that's how it is. Yeah. It aligns everyone's interest towards one thing, but you're really just advocating for human flourishing or freedom at the end of the day. So it's like, how can someone... Yeah. It's very hard to counter that once you understand the Bitcoin narrative. It's exactly. like to, to go against Bitcoin is like, what, you don't want humans to be free and flourish? Well, let's hear that explanation. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. But getting them over that line is obviously uh, tricky. Yeah. And um, you have to curate the message and whatnot. So. It's it's a battleground of ideas, but you need people to be receptive to those ideas in the first place. Yeah. You could have the best idea in the world, but if no one's listening. listening to you, right. yeah, <laughs> then, it, then it just doesn't matter. Right. And... Uh, I mean, we could get into a whole debate here as well about like, is there such thing as true altruism, you know, mm -hmm. doing something without expecting any good for sure, yourself? Sure, sure. Because even the most virtuous uh, politicians or public servants or lobbyists or whatever have some sort of vested interest in what we're doing. And so, again, we don't shy away from that, yeah. right? We say, yes, many of the people in our organization own Bitcoin. Sure. But that's a sign that they believe in it that much. Right. That they're willing right. to put their own life's value into yes. this technology to take the risk to put the skin in the game yeah. like, we, we shouldn't be viewing that as a negative no. and i and i feel like we do that a lot and and that's been painted a certain way largely i would say because of how politicians have abused uh equities markets stock markets mm -hmm. sure. and abused uh, privilege information yeah. and become radically right. wealthy because of that right and so it's tainted our perspective yes. of somebody talking about something or advocating for something that they own right um which is another beautiful thing about Bitcoin is there's no privileged information, right? It's just exactly. open source, nothing is hidden. There's yeah. no gaming. It's just, it is what it is. You decide if it works or not. Yeah. And and that is when you ask Bitcoin versus everything else. Yeah. The beautiful thing about Bitcoin is that Bitcoin sells itself. We're not making up any new information that isn't already out there. Mm -hmm. We're not coming up with a new argument that doesn't already exist in practice. We're just packaging it in a way that people might not have heard before. And so a lot of people ask me, why are you working in Bitcoin? Or uh, people in certain offices will say, why are you Bitcoin and not everything else? And one of the simplest reasons, uh, one of the simplest answers to that is because I can wake up every morning and I can go to sleep at night and sleep soundly saying to you that I think Bitcoin is good mm -hmm. and that I believe Bitcoin helps people currently and that it can continue to help people around the world mm -hmm. if we let it flourish. Mm -hmm. I can't say that about a lot of the rest of the crypto ecosystem. I can't say that right. about very many things at all, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I am in this incredibly lucky situation to be advocating for something that I genuinely believe in and that exists without, no matter what I do, this thing is going to continue doing what it does. Yeah. Bitcoin is, 
TikTok, next block. Yeah. Bitcoin is going to persist regardless of anything I, I do. Right. I'm just spreading the message. And I'm just saying that if you all open up to that, it can be really good for you. Mm -hmm. It can be really good for your office. It can be really good for your constituents that you're representing. It can be really good for the country as a whole. And so, yeah, do I own Bitcoin? And would Bitcoin's price going up be good for me? Sure. But if Bitcoin stayed the exact same price as it is today, but 7 billion people around the world were using Bitcoin, mm -hmm. the world would be a better place because of it. And That's I would right. die a happy man. Yeah, that's a very strong answer to why Bitcoin. Um, and I think that, man, that is core to its value proposition and success really is that it does turn us into, I, I don't want to say evangelists, but I mean, once you get Bitcoin, it's like, well, okay, I'm a human. I want other humans to succeed and flourish. Yep. Why would I not share this message of this thing that fixes so many problems that humans face? Yeah. And that's the, the, the coalescence of all these different people from all different walks of life getting, arriving at the same conclusion, let's say. I mean, that's a very powerful, compelling force to convert others. 100%. And um, I, I don't see a way that that stops, really. You hit the nail on the head, really. And if you'll allow me, I mean, I'll walk you through a little bit about my Bitcoin journey yeah. and why I'm so passionate about this. And I guess number one, if it was really just about the money, let me tell you, just point blank, would not be running a 501c3 nonprofit. Sure. All those forms are public. You're going to yeah. see my salary when we publish that, you know, at the end of the year, you're going to see how much money we raised. You're asking people for money. You're asking people for their hard-earned money that they have worked for. And you're saying, please give this to my organization. I promise to be good stewards of your money. And I'm going to be advocating for something that I believe in and that hopefully you do too. Um, it's not a luxurious position to be in running like a nonprofit like this. Um, I'm doing it because because I, I really care and because this community has enabled me to do the work that I'm doing. And because even in my short number of years on this planet, I've realized very few people actually get to work on something they're genuinely passionate so about. True. And I'll speak a little broadly about, let's say my generation and the generation of people who are growing up in similar situations as me, which is you're growing up in this digital native world where many people today are being raised by like an iPad. And, uh, you know, I was part of like the last generation who actually got to live in a world where iPhones weren't fully ubiquitous mm. and you didn't just get an iPhone when you were in sixth grade. So I've gotten to see this last kind of vestige, this last transition of a society that was not fully digitally native to a society that every generation from here on out right. is going to be born with an iPad in their hands and uh, digital currency mm -hmm. is going to make so much sense to them. I always come back to like my, my little brother. He loves one of my little brothers. He loves Fortnite. And, you know, Fortnite's this game and uh, they've got like virtual currency, the VC. Mm -hmm. So the concept of like internet money, that's a thing that he has known quite literally since he learned how to talk and learned how to read because mm -hmm. it's part of the games that he's playing. The concept of digital money is not native to the politicians in office, right. things like that. But along with the innovation and along with the world that we live in, I've also seen a lot of really concerning trends with my generation and the generations that are coming after me, which is I'm part of a generation that is <laughs> largely, uh, there's this pervasive feeling of like helplessness mm. and hopelessness. Mm. I think a lot of people are looking around and they're going, wait, college costs $300,000 if I want to go to a four-year private college. Uh, so unless your parents are rich, what, you're just going to graduate with six figures in student debt? Mm. Um, that doesn't seem like it's ideal. So college seems unattainable. Before I worked in Bitcoin, I worked in education. I started an education startup and was focused on helping students figure out how to get into college and how to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And I had my own experience of realizing my parents couldn't afford $300,000 mm -hmm. for a four-year education at some private school. So I had to get scholarships and I had to pay for it myself. And I worked with thousands of students to do that same thing and I help them get into college and I help them figure out how to pay for it and work through their finances and all these things and I realized a couple things one students are not financially literate going into college mm -hmm. 
They're making a decision that is going to shape the rest of their life. They're making a financial decision that most full-fledged adults are not going to be making on a day-to-day basis, a 70K a year decision that's nuts. And they're just told at 17, 18 years old that, well, that's what you do. And good luck. This is the path to a, to a reasonable life. And then, then what's happening, you graduate from that school and let's say you got a hundred can debt, but you're a, so, you're a, uh, maybe you're not a software engineer. Um, maybe you, you go into it mm-hmm. and you're making decent money. Mm-hmm. Um, your degree doesn't really apply to what you're doing now, but mm-hmm. like, you know, you got the degree and, and you're happy. And then you live in, I don't know, pick any state. Um, <laughs> and let's say you live in California and you live in California and you're like, oh my God, I'm making 70, 80 K a year and I will never buy a home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will never have enough money to buy a home. How am I going to put my kids through college? What am I going to do? And then you're looking around and you're looking at COVID and you realize some of the most formative years of our lives were spent in this pandemic and society has radically shifted and you're seeing middle-class America lose trillions of dollars worth of wealth. And you're seeing the richest people in the country gain trillions of dollars worth of wealth. Mm-hmm. And all this is to say, I'll tell you, a lot of people my age, they're just, everybody is looking at the same problems and everybody's finding a different boogeyman. Yeah, for sure. They all know that wealth inequality is bad. They all know that not being able to buy a home is bad. They all know that college is way too expensive. They all know all of these things are bad. Mm. And some people turn to socialism and they think that's the answer. (laughs) Some people turn to straight anarchy and they Mm -hmm. think that's the answer and Mm -hmm. blow it all up and Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. Some people just straight up get depressed and nihilistic and go, well, yeah. you know, noth- it's all hopeless. I've turned to Bitcoin. Yeah. And I don't need to repeat it for your audience, you know, I'm sure. Uh, but like, there's a reason that once you start identifying the root of a lot of these problems, you end up coming to Bitcoin. Yeah. Because everybody is seeing the same problems. Now it's a matter of how did we get here? Yeah, no, it's it's great, and I'm um, congratulations on identifying the right boogeyman because it is the money largely and the corrupt money that leads to all these other corrupt consequences. It's not something everyone wants to hear about. You don't want to hear that the U.S. dollar is a pyramid scheme, especially if you're talking to politicians and policymakers. But it is what it is, and it's like we want to fix the world. Yeah. Well, then you got to fix the money. Social security. That's another one. Uh, we're growing up. My generation. We're growing up in a world being told your generation won't have enough money in social security right. by the time you're 65. Yeah. Right. <laughs> what? So we built this system that we know just wasn't going to work because of a slight population change. And we're just continuing to put money in that system. I have thousands of dollars every year going into some social security account yeah. that I'm never going to see a dollar of, or maybe I do, but it's a fraction mm-hmm. that's broken. Yeah. So everybody's seeing the cracks now. I, I think the other thing to mention the reason I brought up the digitally native piece is our generation and and uh, the generation before us and all the generations after us, because we live in the information age, we're less susceptible to any form of propaganda than any other, you know, uh, yeah. people before us. Yeah, yeah. And right. so it's a lot harder to just take it at face value and say the United States is good in every single situation, and that the government is always looking out for your best interests. Because I don't know, I, a bunch of my friends, you just pull up like the CIA Wikipedia page <laughs> and, and, and just the stuff that right. we know about. And you're like, wait, that doesn't sound like right. a government that's always looking out for the best interests of its people. Yeah. And so I think it's fine to to believe in a system broadly and believe in a democratic republic and believe in a, a free market and uh, all of these different ideas and also be able to point out the flaws yeah. in the system that exists today. And uh, not everything needs to be um, uh, a full binary either. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of times we, we get hung up on, um, it either has to be this way or this way. Right. Um, but I think a lot of times, you know, once you start pointing out, uh, the right problems and the same problems, then we're in a position where we can actually start ideating solutions and create a, a system that is better for everyone involved. Yeah. No, that's well said. And yeah, I've gotten hope for the younger generations growing up in the digital age because it does seem to enhance your capacity to see through bullshit. Um, you're just ta- like you're wired into the global hive mind, right, via the yeah. internet and all that. So hopefully, we'll see through the illusions of fiat money and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, all super cool, super important work you're doing too. Appreciate it, um, Grant. Man, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. This yeah, is great. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, I'm on Twitter. 
Grant underscore McCarty. Uh, BTC Policy Org or BTC Policy dot org is where you can find find BPI's work. At the end of the day, I am the. I don't know. Don't don't really follow me. Like follow me to see what BPI is doing. Mm-hmm. Right. That's what this is about. This is about me platforming all of the brilliant people that we have involved in our organization and bringing their message to the people who need to hear it. So yeah, if you want to keep up with what I'm doing, by proxy, you're going to be keeping up with what BPI is doing. Uh, if you want to check out the policy summit that we had, again, it's Bitcoin Policy Summit. You can just Google that or uh, throw it in YouTube and find clips of that, find the whole live stream. Everything that we do, we try to keep it open source, put it out publicly. So uh, Q3, Q4 of this year, we're hoping to put out some uh, research on Bitcoin's environmental impact, mm. hoping to put out some research on uh, the future economic benefits of the Lightning Network in the United States. So keep an eye out for, you know, real academic research that we're going to be publishing from BPI in the coming months. But until then, just uh, keep on orange peeling, keep on talking to people about this stuff. We are, we're one part of this and we talk to politicians in DC that has to happen on all levels, has yeah. to happen on a state level, on a local level, um, has to happen online, it has to happen in person. And so uh, I feel very lucky to be able to be doing what I'm doing. And I feel very lucky to be able to talk to the audience that I'm talking to. But the best part about what I'm doing is really anyone could do it. Yeah. We're just the ones who who did it. Yeah. <laughs> right. So and and I hope more come along. That that's the ultimate goal. If yeah. if BPI is successful, there will be more BPIs in the future. There'll be more Bitcoin lobbying organizations. Yeah. You know, there'll be more uh super PACs that are spending money on Bitcoin candidates, right? Like uh we're trying to be like a nexus point in DC so that we're not the only ones or Bitcoin Today Coalition, right? Like we're not the only groups that are fighting on behalf of Bitcoin. Yeah. The ideal world is we're just one of hundreds of organizations right. that are focused on Bitcoin. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I love that Bitcoin turns us individually and our businesses into orange pilling machines. And there's room, like for anyone that's listening to this that's not involved, like there's room for everyone. Like exactly. I know guys that run real estate businesses that have turned that into an orange pilling machine. Like, yeah. You can you can incorporate this basically in any business so bitcoin touches everything bitcoin touches everything exactly so grant man thank you so much thank you